All right, now we're all set. <laughs> okay, thanks. So, uh, I am not Daniel McKay, the Deputy Commissioner for Historic Preservation, who is trapped on the road out by Letchworth State Park. Uh, I am Dan McEnany. I am the Community Outreach Coordinator for the Office of State Parks, Historic Preservation's Division for Historic Preservation. Um, I want to welcome you, and on behalf of Eric Coolsey, we're happy that you could join us. Uh, that we're a small group, which is great because we can ask a lot of robust questions here. Uh, New York State Parks is the valuable store of over 180 state parks uh, in New York State and 37 historic sites. Uh, within the Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation is the Division for Historic Preservation. Uh, which is commonly known to many of you as the SHPO or the State Historic Preservation Office. Our office was established uh, after the passage of the 1966 Historic Preservation Act, and it is our job to carry out both the Federal Act and the 1980 Companion Act, as well as historic preservation components under uh, the State Environmental Quality Review Act. Uh, next slide, please. So we want to go over today uh, a little bit about the state plan, uh, which we do about every five to six years. This is a requirement for uh, the National Park Service Department of the Interior in our agreement um, under the Historic Preservation Fund, which provides about roughly one third of the staffing costs for the SHPO, as well as funding for many of our programs, such as the Certified Local Government Program. Um, so we revisit this plan um, every year uh, to do an update. And the next slide, please. Most importantly, I, I want to highlight, and I'm not going to read all the words that are on the page because you guys know, um, you know, everybody can, can read what's here. Specifically, what I want to emphasize is that the Historic Preservation Plan is not a plan for the New York State Historic Preservation Office. This plan really is a guide for uh, all New Yorkers of various interests in preservation, historic sites, history, preservation planning, architecture, and design. Uh, we look at this as guidelines uh, that help, you know, certainly drive some of the priorities that we have had as an office, but that communities and individuals can take on to empower their local communities and organizations to take action in the field of historic preservation. Uh, next slide, please. So, Paige, you want to take over from here? Yeah, sure. So, um, what you were saying here is essentially the quick version of the index for the State Historic Preservation Plan. Um, again, we're not going to read to you the slides, so let's actually just get to the presentation about, you know, our planning process to create this document and the real, you know, heart of it, which is the um, plan goal and object plan goals and objectives. So, one of the primary reasons that we engage in the planning process is because it involves sharing our expertise with one another. So, planning is people powered, as I like to say, and it's a collaborative effort that builds understanding among stakeholders and helps to create consensus among the planning team. So, to create this 2021-2026 uh, state preservation plan, we started by assembling an in-house core team, as we call it here at State Parks. Um, to prepare the document. Now, this team consisted of leadership and professional staff from both the Division for Historic Preservation as well as the Division of Environmental Stewardship and Planning. So throughout 2020 and into 2021, the core team we met regularly to gather, organize, and analyze data to identify you know, key preservation issues, to discuss an overall vision for preservation in New York State, and to establish priorities for action um, in the upcoming years. So throughout this process, folks that, you know, I'll bet will they're best called, you know, resource experts, um, such as nonprofit preservation organizations, architectural historians, um, and other preservation consultants, you know, were brought into the conversation. And last but not least, we also reached out to the public. So as you saw in the previous slide, statewide plans are definitely the product of collaboration within our agency, as well as broad based, you know, professional partner and public involvement from across the state. Now, our public engagement processes, we try to tailor them to, you know, a way that we can engage diverse groups of stakeholders across the state and leverage a variety of um, participation methods. In a COVID year, it was a little more virtual than we typically like, but we tried to roll with it, right? 
So two online surveys in particular were of the vital components um, of our public engagement process and responses to those surveys uh, really shaped our plan goals and objectives. Now, both surveys provided ample opportunities um, for respondents to share their views with us in a narrative form. And this sort of is a way to ensure that the quantitative data we collected um, you know, was complemented by the qualitative information that you typically get in a one-on-one -on -one conversation you know, with those in-person public meetings, which unfortunately we couldn't host this year. So the general population survey uh, that we distributed um, was designed to solicit input from the public and gauge their familiarity with historic resources, current preservation issues, and identify the priorities that they felt um, we should have for preservation moving forward. We collected over 3,500 public um, responses, um, which is really great. And we actually, in those, those responses, had representation from all 62 counties in our state. Um, next, we had the um, preservation professionals and colleagues survey, which was designed to get input on current issues, threats, opportunities, and priorities from historic preservation professionals or advocates. You know, those people who where preservation is really, you know, part of their daily lives and something they're very familiar with. Um, from that online survey, which was distributed via Facebook and email and sort of professional colleague networks, um, we gathered more than 800 responses. Um, again, we were really lucky in that we got responses from all 62 counties in the state. So, in addition to those two online surveys, the core team also developed um, some questionnaires that we distributed that had open ended prompts that were designed to again gather information from what we'll call, you know, high impact preservation stakeholders. Um, one of these surveys was called the targeted colleagues questionnaire, and it was distributed to more than 60 folks who represent colleague groups, state agencies, architectural firms and historians, um, as well as other preservation consultants across the state. So we were really into questionnaires this year. It was a good way for us to try to gather information in a time of social distancing. So we also created one that we gave out to the state historic site managers, and we got responses back from them that represented about two thirds of the facilities we have across the state. Um, we had another questionnaire that we gave to state historic site friends groups because they're, you know, strong advocates for our historic sites, but they're also, you know, really aware about local visitation um, and sort of the sense of pride and ownership that people have um, in the places that, you know, these sites are at. Uh, we came up with another questionnaire that we gave to archaeologists across the state in which we specifically inquired about the archaeology of underrepresented communities and sort of studies that are ongoing about the sociocultural groups that tend to be upper, underrepresented um, in the historic record. And then finally, complementary to all these surveys and questionnaires, we had um, a really great opportunity to do personal interviews, and those were conducted by the Division for Historic Preservation staff. Um, we consulted with the nonprofit preservation colleagues we have across the state to create a list of interviewees and really, you know, identify um, groups and individuals whose perspectives have been, been historically underrepresented in preservation work and advocacy. We were really, um, we really wanted to make sure that we heard them and those ideas were reflected in the development of this plan. And finally, in advance of releasing the draft that hopefully you all have had an opportunity to review, it's um, online. We can put the link in the comments if anyone needs. Um, but we consulted with colleagues outside our agency to get initial reactions to our draft. Um, the individuals that we sort of invited to take a review at our early drafts, um, you know, had a lot of leadership and diverse experience in preservation work and advocacy across the state. And so we tried to refine our goals and our objectives in light of their comments. And, you know, that was a really invaluable experience for us. So this slide here is just sort of a representation of all the different groups we interacted with, um, you know, and we really appreciate of their time and their expertise that they gave to us. And, um, you know, this plan would be largely impossible to have without, you know, making sure that we weren't just an echo chamber here um, in Albany and at Peebles Island, where the Division for Historic Preservation staff is based. So next, I want to turn it over. To, I don't know why I just ended up changing presenters. It's still me. But I want to get us to talk about the uh, plan goals and objectives, you know, the heart of the plan. Um, this is a long involved process that we're really proud of. And so we hope that these goals and objectives, you know, are responsive to issues that, you know, and see in your own communities um, locally, regionally and statewide. And we hope that this document does a good job at reflecting that we've tried to get an understanding of, you know, the diversity and complexity of preservation challenges that we encounter across the state. So, one of the things I want to mention 1st is a significant change in the way that goals were stated in this 2021 2026 plan versus those that were in the 2015 to 2020 plan. 
Um, and this is the departure from holistic goal statements, as we call them, to sort of issue based ones instead. So the previous plan presented three very broad impact based goals, which you can see on the screen here. Now, while broad based goals, such as um, the ones you see can help stakeholders um, and individuals interested in preservation, you know, share a grand general vision for the future. Um, the statements are often just frankly too broad. And so it leaves those that are trying to implement the plan without a clear understanding of, you know, the actionable steps they can take to, you know, cultivate pride of place um, and no real way to measure sort of implementation progress. So to avoid this uh, sort of pitfall in the planning process this time around, we decided to write issue based goals. Now, these specific issues or topics, as we've also called them, are referred to throughout the plan. And these were topics that were identified um, and, you know, sort of themes that kept arising during our planning um, outreach and engagement efforts. So each topic that you see on the screen here has at least one goal statement, and that goal statement is preceded by a series of objectives, which are the measurable actions that we're all going to, you know, hopefully take over the next couple of years to really sort of bring this plan to life. Uh, many objectives are actually cross listed under 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 other topics, which, um, you know, is to emphasize the interconnected multi multidisciplinary qualities of historic preservation and really reinforce the idea that it's diverse ways of thinking that really reap the best benefits across disciplines and industries and um, across the variety of communities in our state. And so, most importantly, the objectives of our plan are also, um, as Dan said at the beginning of the presentation, you know, are accessible to anyone that's interested. It's it's our hope that objectives are written in such a way that any person, regardless of professional title or affiliation, technical skill set or training, can support the plan and really see a role for themselves um, in the implementation of the document. So now let's go to each of the eight topics, and what we're going to do is I'm going to sort of show you the overall goal we have for each of these topics and give some sort of representative objectives um, for each goal as we move along. So the first theme and goal we have is for inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. And, you know, for the preservation movement to really move forward and contribute in a positive way to public life and public discourse, we really have to acknowledge, you know, and honor the ever evolving, you know, thing that is history. Uh, we must sensitively uncover and sort of examine these diverse and dynamic and sometimes difficult stories that we have to talk about throughout history and in you know contemporary society. Um, we really need to do a better job at equipping one another with the education and resources necessary to access and illustrate and illuminate you know the full spectrum um, of cultural and historic resources that we have across the state. So in centering the tenets of you know inclusion, diversity, equity, and access, I think that's going to really help us in this endeavor to be you know more inclusive as um, as a field. So it's our hope that the objectives under this topic are going to continue the invaluable work that people are already doing today. You know to remove barriers that impede thoughtful acts of preservation. Um, we hope that it's a way to help create environments where people from all backgrounds and experiences are welcomed and they feel that they're engaged in the decision making processes. Um, and we also want more stakeholders to just have access to resources and support systems that are necessary for you know, successful preservation and cultural resource management activities. So some sample, sample objectives that we have you know, to sort of really get at the heart of the um, inclusion, diversity, equity, and access goal are you know, examining existing historic signage for an accurate or inflammatory language, um, coordinating with marginalized or underrepresented groups to develop materials and programming. Um, we also wanna ensure that workplace hiring, commissioner board appointments are really representative of the diversity we do have um, across the state. So our second topic is survey design and protection. And so cultural resource surveys are obviously an essential building block of any effective historic preservation planning, be it at the local, regional, or statewide level. So as preservation planners and advocates, we you know, really depend on survey information to become informed, proactive participants in raising awareness and protecting the resources that connect us to our past and you know, will guide us into the future. So survey documentation and designation work also provide the framework for proper protection and treatment of historic resources, right? So if our communities and local advocates have access to this information about their resources and, you know, acceptable, appropriate treatments for them, um, they're definitely going to be more empowered to make informed decisions and choices about, you know, protection and treatment of resources. So to give some sample objectives again of um, the two goals we have for survey designation protection, um, we want to encourage municipalities to take, undertake historic resource surveys as part of their comprehensive planning efforts. 
Um, another objective is ensuring collaboration with a diversity of stakeholders to create more <coughs> you know, historic context statements. So our third topic is economic development and recovery. So successful preservation, you know, produces positive tangible results for environment and the economy, right? So a completed preservation project, anything from a community survey or building rehab really demonstrates to investors and grantors that preservation activities can create a significant return on investment. And, you know, honestly, the best form of promotion for preservation is just really about amplifying the success and impact of those completed projects. So in promoting those preservation benefits, um, it's really critical also to take into account that groups with smaller capacities and those that promote preservation of traditionally, you know, underrepresented resources are frequently shut out of the opportunity to, you know, get a hold of those technical and financial resources um, that really allow those projects to come to fruition. So, um, you know, ensuring all these groups have access to the programs and tools to achieve these financial goals, you know, has to be a priority um, moving forward, especially as, you know, the needs of our state become you know, pretty manifest as we you know, look towards the post-COVID recovery period. So again, some sample objectives um, include encouraging municipalities to create property tax incentives that provide benefits to property owners that invest in historic resources, um, as well as you know, sort of more an academic take, right? Um, producing those economic impact studies at varying levels and scales to really capture the financial um, impacts of preservation. So fourth here, um, you know, preservation is in and of itself a form of environmental sustainability, our fourth theme here. Um, as a holistic community practice, preservation should really be recognized as a centerpiece of activities, programs, and policies um, that promote socially, culturally, economically, and environmentally sustainable communities. So addressing the impacts of the material fabric of our cultural heritage on the natural environment, um, you know, without giving up the unique characteristics of those historic places um, is going to involve, you know, establishing new thoughtful partnerships moving forward. Um, whether it's partnerships with different agencies, nonprofits, or private firms, we're really lucky in New York to have a, just a wealth of subject matter experts when it comes to environmental sustainability. Um, you know, and I think these groups will be able to, you know, lead, you know, not only our agency, but other advocacy groups and communities, you know, through energy efficiency processes and projects um, that are going to help ensure that historic preservation, um, you know, is really compatible and contributing to a ethos of environmental sustainability. So some sample objectives we have um, that are encapsulated under this goal are promoting, you know, something as simple as repair, salvage and reuse of historic materials. Um, we also would like to see more education of owners and occupants of historic buildings. You know, how do you use the building's features, the stuff that's there? You know, whether it's, you know, closing a window or you're properly using an overhang to, um, you know, really reduce energy consumption. So disaster planning and resilience is our fifth theme here. Uh, New York State is certainly no stranger to geological, hydrological, fire-related, biological threats, you name it, unfortunately. The growing prevalence of disasters, be they natural or man-made, um, threatens not only our public safety and you know our livelihoods, but it also poses a severe threat to our cultural heritage as well. So, as a consequence of you know all this sort of doom and gloom, unfortunately, um, preservationists and advocates have, in recent years, really been forced to adapt, um, dramatically shift their responses and adaptation to these environmental challenges. Um, so, one of the things that's you know. Kind of great is that while disasters may unfortunately you know threaten our resources um the biggest threat of all the one that is is one that really really can be prevented and that's the threat to our resiliency you know our capacity to sort of bounce back to normal so i think together by you know looking at the objectives of this plan and really striving towards this goal you know we can take more intentional uh, measured steps to better integrate disaster resilience and preservation planning um, successful implementation of these objectives, you know, it stands not only to increase our capacity to protect our historic resources, but it will help our state become just more resilient in the face of these threats. So some sample objectives we have for this topic. Um, I will say that so disaster resilience, that uh, disaster planning and resilience, we organize the objectives under this topic um, into four categories, risk assessment, adaptation, mitigation, recovery, and outreach, um, three of these categories are represented on your screen. Um, so some of those objectives include the preparation of those hazard mitigation plans, um, promoting mechanisms, um, funding mechanisms, <coughs> I should say, that really help with adaptation and recovery, 
um, and also just bettering communication among preservation <clears throat> stakeholders and you know the folks that are on the emergency management side of things. Uh, sixth, we have the theme of local preservation. Uh, one of historic preservation's many definitions, right, is that it's a land use management strategy. It's something that you know is embedded in local planning and zoning, and it's a way that we focus laws and policies and tools in hopes of creating cohesive communities and you know strong resilient ones at that. So for many New York State communities, um, it's local preservation ordinance that's actually often considered the best means um, to manage our resources. And so by enacting and enforcing local preservation laws, government can really play a strong role um, in designating, protecting, and stewarding our really unique historic resources we have. So it's our hope that you know moving forward, decision makers continue to collaborate with the folks in their community to preserve that character and you know expand their training that they even have in house. Um, it's you know thoughtful management of change over time that really helps ensure that communities can protect and showcase the elements of their you know areas and neighborhoods that they think are really special. So some of the objectives we have under local preservation um, include providing educational training and opportunities in a variety of mediums that are accessible to people. Um, and also just encouraging community members to um, explore their local histories and stories to really sort of, you know, cultivate that sense of pride in place. Um, it's, you know, referencing the old plan. So seventh, we have uh, partnerships. And so in order to effectively preserve, appreciate, and promote our historic places and stories in the years ahead, um, preservationists really need to strengthen existing partnerships and build those new relationships um, with groups and leaders, you know, folks that may not even see preservation as their primary task or charge. Um, we're all probably pretty aware that there's no single definition of a preservation partner because stakeholders in our field can include, you know, professionally trained planners, um, neighborhood advocates, community groups, government officials, or just, you know, folks that have a vested interest in one particular project, right? Um, you know, it's a broader consortium of partners across our state that's really gonna allow us um, to leverage the resources we do have, um, find new opportunities for preservation, and also continue to, you know, celebrate and really steward the resources that we have in New York. So some sample objectives we created under partnerships um, include identifying new stakeholders, the folks that have diverse perspectives and a variety of experiences to bring to the table, um, as well as just enhancing capacity to exchange information among communities is gonna be really important, you know, honest, open communication. And finally here, uh, eighth, we have public outreach and education as our final theme. Um, preservation initiatives aren't going to grow and they're not going to succeed if it's sort of looked at something that we've siphoned off and, you know, is the sole interest of trained professionals or policymakers, right? Um, you know, the general public has the ability and, you know, probably the interest and enthusiasm in, you know, enriching preservation work and commenting about new programming um, that they'd like to see or just giving you thoughtful feedback on the work you're um, conducting. So, it's, you know, the movement's only going to flourish in the years ahead if we do have that sort of broad, inclusive participation from people of all backgrounds and experiences. Um, you know, if we provide accessible education opportunities, as well as, you know, just offering encouragement for people to get involved, don't make them feel like it's a burden if they want to share their ideas or thoughts with us. So, some of the objectives we have under public outreach and education um, include identifying and removing those barriers to information about preservation, how to get involved. Um, evaluating the needs um, that exist within a community by working with diverse groups who may not have historically been at the table for preservation conversations. Um, and also promoting preservation education and participation in initiatives that again help, you know, create a larger uh, ethos of preservation and of that mindset in the community. So now we're going to talk about implementation. Um, you know, this plan lays out what we feel are actionable goals that are going to allow individuals, communities, organizations, governments, you name it, um, to, you know, sort of tailor the recommended objectives we've put forward in this plan in such a way that's going to allow each party to, you know, meet their own cultural, archaeological, historic resource needs. Um, it's our belief that successful implementation of this plan um, is not going to impede anyone from the work they're already doing. Um, it's just going to further the impact of the work that's ongoing. Um, so it's our hope that plan goals and objectives are going to be revisited annually. We've got a couple ideas of where those forums for conversation and evaluation will take place. Um, one of them is the State Historic Preservation Conference, which is hosted annually. Um, we also have quarterly meetings of the State Board for Historic Preservation. 
And in keeping with, you know, the theme of, you know, this is a people powered movement preservation is right. Um, is our hope that partners across the state and activists are going to, you know, create their own opportunities to look at this plans, goals and objectives. Um, and, you know, and have those regular regional colleague gatherings or community meetings, or just sort of any other discussion or advocacy events. Um, so, it, you know, it, it goes without saying almost that it's a reality that the recovery from COVID-19 is it's going to take the lifespan of this plan, if not <laughs> dramatically longer, um, which, you know, complicates implementation, right? Um, but we're really lucky that the preservation community is really resilient and it's, you know, repeatedly demonstrated its resourcefulness and creativity in challenging times and how to, you know, make forward progress. Um, obviously, the availability of funding for preservation, it's going to determine the pace and sequencing of the plan's recommended actions. Um, but we're lucky that there are many statewide and um, regional funding sources available for preservation groups, organizations, and individuals. Um, this plan um, includes a list of active funding sources that could insist, um, you know, at the more localized level for implementation. Um, and I will add that this list is not meant to be exhaustive or complete. It's you know always advisable to think pretty broadly and creatively about where you can find funding sources and tap into resources that others might sort of overlook. So um, before we get to the fun, you know, engaging part of our presentation, I do want to talk about um, environmental review. So it is a requirement um, pursuant to the State Environmental Quality Review Act or SEEKER that the draft present preservation plan does include a draft generic environmental impact statement or a GEIS. Um, the GEIS identifies the environmental setting for our plan, which consists of the people of the state of New York and all our sort of natural, recreational, scenic, historic, cultural resources, as well as the social and economic characteristics of our state. Um, the GEIS identifies two alternatives as the language for it. One, the no action alternative, which is we just keep the status quo and we don't think we can do any better in the planning process or sort of the aspirational qualities of planning. Um, or the preferred alternative, which is our second alternative, which is adoption and implementation of this plan. So the primary impact of the plan is that it's going to, you know, promote the plan's goals and objectives statewide. And, you know, we've seen that it's, you know, it's really, I, I like to think it's pretty robust. It calls for being more inclusive. It calls for robust public outreach, education, access, improved environmental sustainability, um, partnership building, and a, a whole array of uh, elements. Uh, the the uh, GEIS identifies potential environmental impacts of the plan's implementation and the resource categories that are likely to be affected. So it goes without saying that, you know, it's archaeological resources, historic and cultural resources and community character that stand to be most um, influenced by implementation of this plan. And since this is a generic EIS, it covers the whole state. So the impacts that are outlined in the written environmental review chapter of this document um, are pretty broad. It explains more sort of the cumulative impacts we expect to see as this plan is implemented, um, which, you know, is, if anything, hopefully a maintain, maintaining of the sort of current preservation services that exist and hopefully, you know, expansion of those services um, and more protection of the cultural and archaeological resources we have, um, as well as just, you know, the benefits that we tapped on earlier, which are the, you know, advantages of the economic activity that come from preservation as well. Um, the last thing I want to say on this slide is that after the plans adopted um, and starts to, you know, see the more implemented facets of it, um, each of those projects does undergo seeker review at a local level. And so if there are any more adverse impacts, um, those are definitely going to be explored in future planning and environmental review on a project by project basis. So now we're getting to the fun part where I stop gabbing and we get to listen to you. So I'm going to turn the proverbial mic back over to Dan in a moment, who's going to facilitate public comment and take clarifying questions. But I want to make sure that we're all aware of the options you have for how to comment on this document. Um, so first, you can speak tonight. We're here, ready to listen, taking notes. Um, you can also email us your thoughts at the ship.plan at parks.ny.gov email address, which is um, where you all receive communications from me. Um, we're accepting comments on the plan through close of business on Friday, October 15th. And you can also, last but not least, drop Dan a letter. We've got the email, um, not the email, but the address there below. And again, those um, handwritten or typed letters of comments need to be postmarked by Friday, October 15th as well. 
Now, after we receive your comments, um, we review all of them. We sort of organize them by theme, and then they are published as part of the final generic environmental impact statement. Your comments are not attributed to you individually or to your organization if you write on behalf of a larger group. Um, and we do respond to any substantive comments. You know, if you have a question, why didn't we include something? We either say that's a great idea, and we tell you we're including it, or we, you know, explain why we're not including it. Um, it's sort of a you know call and response activity. So it probably goes again without saying, but um, anyone wishing to comment, please be mindful of your speaking time, respectful of others on the call. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan. Thanks, Paige. I appreciate that. Um, I do want to remind people who joined us late that this uh, conversation is being recorded. Uh, so we're going to open up the floor in just a moment. I do want to really compliment um, Paige, and I'd like to introduce uh, Francis Stern, who, who is also here. While I had a role putting this plan together and helping organize, um, Paige and Fran are really what I consider to be the principal authors of this document, which I think is a huge change from previous efforts this office has made. Uh, their work is incredibly impressive. It's planning during a pandemic is no easy challenge. So this was really a labor of love. And, uh, you know, I, I, I really, my, my hat is off to both of them for what they have done. And it, completing this plan will leave uh, quite a hole in, in, uh, in their schedules because this has been a lot of work. So I'd like to open the floor up right now for any questions you have. Uh, we're here to listen. Uh, we're, we'll be writing down and making comments. I hope that people have been able to view the plan in full on our website when we sent out the invitation. So the floor is really yours. If you want to take yourself off mute, put yourself on camera so, so we can see that you have a question, please let us know. Or I'm going to call on the crowd. Any questions from the group or observations? Okay, maybe I'll start. <laughs> okay, thanks, Nadine. I, I want to um, I want to thank all of you for producing this document. In, in past lives, I've been involved in doing stuff like this, and um, I recognize the amount of work um, and integrity in it. So, thank you very much. I also uh, very much appreciate uh, the uh, emphasis on inclusion, and I think it will give us um, having documents like this, uh, like in a small community, a small village, like uh, the village of Owego. Um, when we are engaged in advocating for certain things, having something, a document like this to refer to and to quote from uh, gives us a um, uh, more power in our uh, in our arguments and in our um, advocacy. So it really um, I'll bring this back to my commission and I'll make sure that the other commissioners are familiar with it and um, we, it'll help us a lot. Uh, we live in a, we live in a community that still our uh, high school team is still the Indians and um, and here we are um, with a huge Clinton Sullivan campaign monument right by the river too. And, um, and the Indian that they have chosen for many years to be their mascot is, is a Plains Indian. And so I, I could go, I'm waiting, um, I, it's going to come, but I think it has to come. I'm hoping that some high school student or somebody like that will bring the issue forward, not some adults in the community. Uh, but I, I think it's uh, it's going to come and it'll be some sort of um, a, a discussion uh, in the community. But um, this kind of a document and this uh, emphasis on inclusion is um, long overdue. And so I very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. If you've noticed the layout of um, <clears throat> Paige's goals and object, uh, objectives, um, really, Diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as the theme of access, was probably one of the largest responses we had um, from all of our data collection. So we spent a lot of time thinking about it, and really, uh, that was really why we, we zeroed in on doing targeted interviews with, with underrepresented community members. So, so thank you for that. 
you have another question or observation about the plan? All right, this is a quiet group, which is okay. You still have an opportunity to comment. If you haven't reviewed the full document, you can find it on our website. It was included in the invitation. Hello, this is Randolph Warner calling. Hi, Randolph, how are you? I, I'm sorry I'm coming in audio only, but uh, I, I feel a fellowship around this wonderful planning effort and this wonderful look ahead to greater advocacy. And I'll, I'll expand my remarks in writing, but besides thanking the two authors and the rest of your team, I would simply say, I will look to this document as a model to be promulgated across state government because SHPO and our OPRHP are a cultural and intellectual resource many times overlooked by other state agencies, by municipalities, by, by other local governments, with respect to the complex interplay between our built fabric, our historic built fabric, the context for our historic resources across our communities and, and the things that are going on looking forward. I, I think that that kind of, I, I think that that kind of robust interaction. I'm sorry, Randolph, do you wanna continue? I'm not sure if Robert, We'll let him speak after. Uh, okay, uh, I was just saying that I, I, I think I correctly anticipate an opportunity for much more robust interaction between state agencies, SHPO, OPRHP, local communities, local governments, and and I think that this study is so comprehensive that it anticipates opportunities to do that. And I certainly will advocate for it. That's great. You know, <clears throat> our mission in state parks is to be as paper free as possible. So this exists online and will be shared uh, as widely as we can, but we are doing a limited printing, really targeting our state legislator and municipalities so that they physically have a copy of this on hand for, for reference. So we, we expect to, push this plan into as many hands as we can and get it viewed by as many people to help adopt and, and find themselves within that plan in ways that can advance some of the objectives. All right. Any additional comments here? All right. I think we're gonna wrap it up for tonight. Uh, as Paige referenced, you, you can email us. You can send in your letters and comments. I hope you enjoy the plan, that, that you, you see value in it for you and your communities. I think there's a great emphasis on what we can do locally as well as, as, as state uh, stakeholders. So thank you very much. I appreciate people coming out tonight. And with that, we're gonna end the recording and say good night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good